Good morning, everyone. Well, welcome to church. <laughs> I hope you're all doing great. Glad to have you here today. Hope you were able to also uh, check out the announcements and see all of the upcoming events that are going to be happening here. Most importantly, Vacation Bible School is coming in July, and we want to make sure that we have enough volunteers for that, and we also want to make sure we have enough kids for that. So if you would like to volunteer, please let us know either by going um, on the website or calling the church office. You can register either of those ways. If you have a child, a grandchild, um, a niece, a nephew, anybody who's interested in being a part of Vacation Bible School, and they're between the ages of kindergarten and fifth grade, we're um, taking applications for them as well. So we want to try to have a big Vacation Bible School since we haven't been able to have one for a couple years. So we want to have everybody back again and having a great time. So hopefully uh, you'll check that out if you're interested. Check out the bulletin or the website for other things that are going on in the church. And then we're going to stand up and worship this morning. So please stand up and uh, prepare your hearts to worship. We're going to uh, begin with a song this morning that's called Without You. And the basic rest of it is I'm Nothing. And it is true. We are nothing without the Holy Spirit in us helping to guide us, helping us to act in this world the way that Christ wants us to behave and the way that Christ wants us to act. So join us this morning as we sing Without You. Without the pain, without 
start to change this world by letting the Holy Spirit work through us. Not so much letting ourselves do the talking, but let our, our thoughts come out, our hearts come out, because the Holy Spirit is leading us. And we truly know that we belong to Him. He has paid the price for us. We are His. We are His children. So I want you to sing out. Can you clap along the screen? Come on, let's make a joyful noise in this place.
just so rich and give it to you. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back with you this week after having a Sunday off last week for Memorial Day weekend, which is always a busy weekend in our house because not only is it Memorial Day weekend, but it's Becca's birthday, it's her uncle's birthday, and it's her grandmother's birthday all on the same day. So we had about 15 to 20 people at our house all weekend, so I was in no place to preach last weekend. (laughs) But I'm glad to be here with you this morning to... Uh, wrap up the series that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks about why we do the things that we do, right? Why do we worship the way that we worship? Why do we have the rituals and the sacraments and the practices that we have in the life of the church? Why do we do them? And the whole purpose of this, the whole reasoning behind it for me was that I know that sometimes I need a reminder of what's important. Sometimes I need a reminder of why I do the things that I do because it's easy for me to get sidetracked and to focus on things that are less important or uh, sort of secondary issues or I just kind of lose focus on what the real reason is for why we're doing things. I know that that's the case for me in areas outside of faith in my life, especially if I'm uh, playing board games or card games with my kids. Uh, I probably need a reminder of why I'm doing it uh, and not to give my daughter, uh, you know, draw four cards over and over again when we play Uno or something like that. Um, But we're doing it to to play. We're doing it to have fun. We're doing it to bond, not to win. Um, Those are the kinds of things that I need to remember. And I think we need those, those times in our life of faith, too, Uh, to remember why we do the things that we do, why we worship in the first place. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today, because sometimes we need a reminder of why we worship, right? Just as a whole, why do we worship? Why do we spend our time gathering together? Why do we spend our time in our life and talk about worship so much? Because everything else that we've talked about, right, whether it's sacraments or holidays or prayer or other aspects of our life and faith, It all kinds of gets wrapped up in worship, right? Sacraments are part of worship. Prayer is part of worship. All of these things are part of worship. So why do we do what we do? And what do we mean by worship? 
Because that's one of those things where we could talk about worship in a number of different ways. Because on the one hand, everything that we do or everything that we're supposed to do is an act of worship. right? As people of faith, as followers of Jesus Christ, as people who call ourselves disciples... Everything that I do is meant to be an act of worship, right? I'm supposed to be showing people who Jesus is and and being a representative for Christ in the way that I live my life. So the way that I treat people, the way that I uh, go about my daily work and business on a a day-to-day basis, the way that uh, I do everything is an act of worship. But then we also have this particular time every week we set aside that we call worship, where we call this a worship service when we gather together as a community of faith to sing songs, to say thank you to God, to pray, to look at the scriptures, to interpret the scriptures, and to apply them to our lives, which is an important part of our life of faith. And I think we are reminded of that, or if there's anything that we were reminded of during this whole time of pandemic was how much we need to be together and how much we need to gather together because that was something that we couldn't do for a while, right? That was something where they were like, the the things that spread COVID the most are being together in large groups and indoor spaces and singing. That's kind of what we do, right? So that made it a little difficult sometimes when we gather together. So uh, we are reminded of how important those things are when, you know, they're taken away from us or we're not able to do things the way that we normally would. We're reminded of that. No matter how much we would do other things uh, to try to to try to fill that gap, we know that there's not the same thing as just being together in a community of faith. So when we gather together for worship, part of it is this act of thanksgiving, right? That we gather together, we say thank you to God for what God has done in our lives. Whether that's uh, just thank you to God for giving us Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior. And a lot of our worship songs will sing about those types of things. Sometimes it's being thankful to God for what's happened in our life over the last week or over the last uh, period of time since the last time we gathered together. But part of it also is not just to say thank you to God for what God has done, but also to ask God to continue to be present in our lives moving forward. Because as much as I like to be thankful, there's usually something on my mind when I come to church on a Sunday morning that I'm still trying to figure out, or that I still am in need of prayer for, that I'm still trying to wrestle with, that you know, my heart's broken over something that happened in the world that week, or I'm struggling with something as a parent or as a husband or as a pastor that I'm trying to deal with and wrestle through. And gathering together for worship is a way of asking for prayer, being in part of a community where we all have this mutual struggle together. And I think we need to be reminded of that because it helps us be authentic in our faith. And I think sometimes we lose that when we lose sight of what worship is. That coming to church, being a part of worship is not pretending to be better than we are or pretending to have things together. We need to be authentic so we can ask for prayers from other people, to share our lives of faith with each other and to say, I need help in this. I'm still struggling through this. I'm still trying to figure out what God's will in my life is for X, Y, or Z. So that's part of why we gather together. And part of it is looking into the scriptures as a community of faith, right? I can read the Bible by myself at home, but there's a difference in coming and being a part of a group, where whether it's within a Sunday morning context or a Bible study context, where we're looking at a scripture and saying, how does this apply to my life? How do I interpret this scripture so that it makes sense to me in my day and time? Because as much as we like to say that scripture is really easy to read and apply to our lives, sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes things can be black and white. Sometimes things can be really clear for us. But nine times out of ten when we read scripture, we're saying, how do I take this writing that was written 2,000 years ago or further back and apply it to what my life looks like in 21st century America? Right, It's a different context, it's a different culture, and we're trying to say, what does the scripture say, and then how do I apply it to my life? So there's an aspect of interpretation, that's what we do when we preach, that's what we do when we do Bible studies, and we gather together and we share our perspectives on things, which is helpful because it helps us see things from another person's perspective, 
that the way that I read a scripture passage might be different than the way that you read it, uh, and that might be different than the way that somebody else reads it. And when we gather together and share that, it helps us get a better understanding or a better perspective on what that scripture passage is. The downside or the hard part of that is, is that we always have to be cautious that we're not interpreting scripture in a way that just reinforces what we think or feel anyway, right? And that's the difficulty when we talk about interpretation, because so often, and human history bears this out, we interpret scripture uh, to do what we want to do anyway, (laughs) right? And we can look throughout various times in history where people have looked at scripture and used scripture passages to hurt other people, uh, to oppress other people, to do awful things in the name of God. We can think about the Crusades. We can think about different genocides throughout the course of world history. We can think about slavery. We can think about all of these different things that people could use Scripture to justify. So how do we read Scripture in a way that we're interpreting it faithfully instead of using it to kind of serve my purposes anyway? And really the way that scripture gets back to that is this understanding of the Holy Spirit being an important part of our life and faith. That what guides us in our interpretation is the Holy Spirit that guides us to having a better understanding of what God would want us to learn from something. Today in the life of the church and the church calendar is the day that we celebrate the Holy Spirit on the the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, which is the day that we celebrate in the life of the church that the Holy Spirit came upon the early church and filled them with the Holy Spirit so that they could go out and do the work that God gave them to do to spread the gospel and to really start the birth of the church after Jesus ascended into heaven. The story of Pentecost comes from chapter 2 of Acts, which is right after Jesus ascends, uh, goes uh, back to be with God, Uh, And he tells his disciples, he tells his followers uh, to basically hang tight and that the Holy Spirit is going to come uh, and fill them with the Holy Spirit and they will do even greater things than Jesus had done in his ministry once that happened. So uh, to kind of summarize the story, uh, they are meeting together, they are gathered together on this Feast of Pentecost, which is uh, a a Jewish holiday to begin with, where a lot of people were on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So they're gathered together in a room that's closed off, the windows are shut, the doors shut, and all of a sudden this violent rushing wind comes through the windows and it blows the windows and the doors open and these tongues of fire uh, fall on each of the disciples uh, right over their heads and they start to speak in tongues. They start to speak languages that they didn't know before. And people who are passing by on the streets are hearing them say these things. And they're saying, how are they speaking my language? I know they're from Galilee. How are they speaking my language? How do I hear what they're saying in my language? What's going on here? What is happening in this moment? And then Peter stands up very courageously and gives a sermon to explain to them that this is about the Holy Spirit and explains to them about what Jesus had done and what Jesus is still doing in their lives and, and how he's their Messiah and how he's their Savior. And that is our first example of the power of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit transforms Peter from this person who not long ago was denying Jesus, denying even knowing him to save his own skin, is now standing up in front of thousands of people and telling people about the message of the gospel. And that's through the power of the Holy Spirit. He gets this courage in him and he preaches this message and the scripture tells us that 3,000 people were added to their numbers that day which sounds like an evangelist dream, right? If I could give a sermon and I could say 3,000 people would hear it and come to knowledge of Christ and join our community, that sounds great, doesn't it? Until you have to feed everyone, until you have to organize everyone, until you have to sort of build systems and structures so that people don't feel left out or forgotten or that they're not cared for. And that's part of what we're trying to figure out about this early church, that all of a sudden they go from this group of disciples who are hiding in one room, that now there's 3,000 people, 
which is a blessing, but there's also things that they have to figure out about how do they organize their life? How do they organize their worship? And that's the scripture passage that I want to focus on this morning because I think in the aftermath of Pentecost, we get a a glimpse of what the earliest church structure about how do they worship uh, we find in Acts chapter 2. So I want to read Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Uh, and this happens right after uh, the, the experience of Pentecost and Peter's sermon, and that 3,000 have added to their numbers uh, that day. And this is what it says. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So 3,000 people joined their community. And I think it's important for us to remember, because this is key to the story, is that these aren't 3,000 of the same type of person, right? It's not uh, clones of the same people. They're not all from Galilee. They're not all from Jerusalem. Like I said, this is when there are people from all over the known world that were worshiping the Jewish God are coming to Jerusalem We have people who are speaking different languages, who have different interpretations on on what the Torah or the Jewish law is telling them to do and and how to live their lives. We have different cultural practices. We have different dietary practices. So it's not just 3,000 people that they have to deal with. They have to deal with 3,000 very diverse people who don't speak the same language, don't eat the same food. And what do they do? They gather together as a community They look at scriptures, they teach scripture, but then they also spend time in fellowship together. They spend time eating meals together. They spend time just gathered together and and, and, and looking and, and learning from each other's lives, praying, breaking bread together. That's what the early church looked like. If we want to know what the earliest church communities looked like, this is where we find it. And my favorite line in the whole thing is it says that all who believed were together and all and they had all things in common. Meaning that they were all together as one group, that they didn't break off into groups based on what their interpretation was or what their language was or what their uh, practices were. They were all together as a group of believers. That sounds so refreshing to me. <laughs> Because so much of our modern church that I like to call adventures in missing the point is us splitting over things about how we worship, about our approach to things, about our cultural differences, about our differences of interpretation. And it seems like in our modern day and time, church seems to be a place more where people are separated more than anything else, right? There's that uh, famous quote by Martin Luther King Jr. who says that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in the time of the week, right? Where we kind of split up, we find people who look like us, who worship like us, who like the same worship music as us, that like the same order of worship or the same preaching style as us, and that's where we go. But the early church says they were all together, People from different backgrounds, people who ate different foods, people who spoke different languages were all together. Does it mean that they didn't have issues and interpretation, things that came up that they had to deal with? No. Acts is full of times where there was conflict in the church, where they had to figure out how to do different things or what it meant for them to be Christian and what practices were important in their life of faith. They had to deal with that. They had to figure things out as they went along, but they were all together. That's what the early church looked like. They weren't focused on saying, you're a Christian if you fit the mold of X, Y, and Z. 
And that's what our world looks like today, where if you uh, vote a particular way or if you believe particular things uh, from a theological perspective or from a social perspective or from a political perspective or you have uh, different um, likes or desires in the way of your worship music uh, or the way that you like a sanctuary to look or all of those different things, we are separated by those things. And sometimes we miss the point when we're doing that. That's why we need to remember why we worship. We don't worship because it's enjoyable. Hopefully it is, right? Hopefully we come to a place where we enjoy the music that we hear and we enjoy being together, but that's not the primary purpose of meeting our needs. It's about being together as part of a community and meeting each other's needs, right? It says they had all things in common. They sold all that they had. They shared their possessions and their goods so that if anyone in the community was in need, that they could meet those needs. That's the point of worship. It's about uh, being in a place where they can praise God, it says, and have the goodwill of all people, that they're eating meals together with glad and generous hearts, right? It's this picture of community that we often miss, but it's what we're called to be. And so often we miss the points. We get sidetracked with things that aren't as important. Yes, we have other things that we have to talk about and deal with and, and, and work our way through, that the United Methodist Church is living in real time. But that's not the primary purpose of what we're doing because then it's about being right. It's not about the process. It's not about the community. It's not about how do we talk to each other so that we stay at the table together. And that could be about things that seem big or things that seem small. Every pastor that I know has a story of something that they thought wouldn't be a big deal, but ended up being a big deal. <laughs> One of my best friends uh, was a pastor at... Um, a smaller church where they had just merged congregations. One was a new church start, uh, and they were meeting in a more traditional space, but they wanted to make it more contemporary. Uh, so they decided to take the pews out of the sanctuary and replace them with chairs that they could move around during the week. That was kind of the model of church at the time where you could use chairs uh, because then not only are they more comfortable, more comfortable usually, uh, but they are more multi-purpose, right? So that during the week in the sanctuary, you could set them around in circles and you could have Bible studies and small groups and things like that. But when they started taking the pews out of the sanctuary, you would have thought that they started worshiping a different God because of the way that people responded about what kind of seat we sit on in church. Right? It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, but when things like that happen, and we all have things like that that are seemingly minor, but we make big deals, that we're missing the point, right? The point is that we have a place to worship. The point is that we have a seat to sit in and we have a community to gather with. And that's why we need to be reminded of that sometimes. Because every time we start to make church about something other than worshiping God and praising God and uh, praising God and having the goodwill of all people, then we're missing the point and we need to be redirected back to that. My favorite way of thinking about the life of faith comes from uh, the Westminster Catechism that says that man's chief end or the person's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That that's really how we can encompass everything, that that's what worship is. It's about glorifying God and living in the joy of God, enjoying God forever. So part of our faith in life is joy it's about glorifying God, and it's about joining together in a community to say, well, how do I glorify God with my life? How do I glorify God with uh, the way that I treat people at the grocery store? How do I glorify God with uh, dealing with challenges that come my way? And how do I glorify God with how I walk through tragedy in my life? How do I glorify God with how I worship on Sunday morning? how I approach uh, issues and, and, and things that happen and come up in our life and in our world and in our communities that we have to uh, focus on and that we have to uh, spend time on interpreting Scripture and what it means in the light of whatever is going on in our world. But it really all comes down to that community, a community that meets people's needs, 
but is also open to change. Because keep in mind here that yes, 3,000 people were added to their number at one time, but it wasn't just a one-time thing. It says at the end of the passage that we read, and day by day the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. So every time that they figured out a way to meet people's needs, all of a sudden new people come in, different people come in, people from different backgrounds or different languages are coming in and making it more and more diverse. So they have to be open to change. But luckily the Holy Spirit works in us to be able to address those things and to help us interpret what scripture is telling us in light of new information, in light of new people coming in to our communities. The scripture says, all who believed were together and had all things in common. That They devoted themselves to fellowship, gathering together, that they devoted themselves to breaking bread together, eating meals together, praying for one another and to the apostles' teachings. We are called to do the same thing. Our life, our faith is meant to look like this where we can praise God and have the goodwill of all people in mind. So when we do, do those things, that day by day, people are added to our numbers, and we can have glad and generous hearts, and we can worship God by glorifying him and enjoying him forever. Amen? Amen. You'd please, at this time, as we transition to our service of Holy Communion, uh, if you'd like to follow along in the hymnals, Uh, In your pews, uh, we will be starting on page 9 with the Great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, our honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of that one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The body of Christ broken for you. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ shed for you. Brothers and sisters, this is the Lord's table. It is not our own. You do not need to be a member of this church or of any church to partake of these elements of this sacrament. We have an open table in the United Methodist Church, which means that if you are longing to know God in your life, or if you are longing to be close to God through the sacrament, then you are welcome at the table. The table has been set for you. The ushers may come forward.
the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Stand with us now as we prepare to leave this morning as we sing our final song in worship and praise. <clears throat> Inside a current that moves and makes you come alive, living water that brings you dead to life. Oh, 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 we're going down to the river, down to the river, down to the river to pray. Let's get washed by the water, washed by the water, and rise up in amazing grace. Let's go down. Drown in the streams that have made me born again Like a tide is rising up Deep inside a current that moves and makes you come alive Living water that brings the dead to life Washed by the water, washed by the water, and rise up in amazing grace. Let's go down.
this place today. Continue your acts of worship with everything that you do. And go now, may you go from this place to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Go now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thank you.